Hello, everyone. Oh, wow, that's very loud. Hello, a warm welcome. Thank you very much for joining us here on a Sunday afternoon. Um, we are very happy to see you here at Berlinale Talents. And as you can see, our topic this year is secrets. It's, um, I would say, if I reveal a secret, it's sharing secrets. So it's more about sharing interesting stuff with you, taking you into the community of very interesting filmmakers. And today we have two very interesting filmmakers here with us. Uh, they know the festival already because they've been here several times and now they are back with a fantastic film we will talk about in length today. And for David also, it's also closing the circle because he's had been uh, before at Berlinale Talents, which is great for us to have him back and uh, to see him here today on stage. And without any further ado, I would love to introduce you to the moderator of the session first, which is also a good friend of us, Christoph Gröner. Thank you, Florian. Thank you. Welcome everybody to the How One. I, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to moderate. And I'm loud or is it too loud? No. Uh, to, uh, to moderate the session uh, with uh, brothers that are kind of inseparable, even if it was rightfully said just one of these uh, brothers was here as an alumnus of the talents. Uh, they've been here in Berlin before with Kid Thing and Kumiko the Treasure Hunter. And uh, we will have the chance to talk about their whole career. Please welcome them with me, Nathan and David Zellner. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the premiere is uh, already was two days ago, and uh, it uh, pr premiered before in Sundance, and it was called a lot of things already. People don't seem to be sure of what they can make of it, be it a deconstructive Western, be it a feminist Western, be it maybe a parody of a Western with strong political undertones or a, a feminist undertones. So how would you describe Damsel? Um, well, I guess it's kind of all those, all those things. And I think what, we, what's, what, what is fun for us when sharing something is uh, that, that we've just made and seen how people react to it for the first time. It's, uh, I, I, I don't know, I like when, it, it's neat seeing people react to, to the same uh, film like in different ways and take different things from it. And, and, and all of those are valid perspectives. And so, um, uh, I don't know, and then, so I, it kind of leaves latitude and not like pin it down into something. But I mean, but there's elements of all those that are, that are accurate. And we can actually see them. I hope some of you have already seen the film. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> three. <laughs> no, but rest assured, we have material here with us. What we're going to do and what we're going to see is a first excerpt of the film that is not right jumping into the very beginning, but into minute five. And we're showing the titles of it. And many of the characteristics of the film are very well in full bloom already by then. <laughs> so uh, please uh, run the excerpt, the first excerpt from Damsel.
I guess one can see very clearly that so many rules are kind of broken in the very first moment. And we had the first laugh when, when stagecoach, where's the damn stagecoach was mentioned, and that is of course a play with also one of the most, uh, most renowned Westerns, stagecoach, name-wise. So I, I just wanted maybe to know first and how did the, the classical Western uh, influence your work here in terms of doing exactly the opposite. How much are you of Western fans, for example? Well, we're, we're huge, uh, we're huge Western fans. We just grew up watching them and, and um, lo love, 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 love the genre. Um, but, and, um, and, but then, and when we, we've wanted to do Western for a long time and it wasn't so much, I, I don't know, like, you know, from the outset, it was it was just uh, it was just that we wanted to do a Western period, and then and then once we sat down and um, and trying to you know come up with a with a story that was interesting to us, it was um, that that's when it was it was like wanting to look at uh, do things differently from from other you know from from other films that that even though they inspired us, they were you know like when people I feel like when people nowadays make a Try to make a classic western, uh, which was, you know, made like from the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. Those were very much, you know, a product of their their times. And 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 I think when um, you're trying to just mimic that, it would it would come off as really artificial. Or if or if people try to when they try to do like a, you know, if, if you try to do a, a spaghetti western now, it would feel it would no matter how good it is, it wouldn't be the same as as um, as a Ser Sergio Leone film. And so. For us, it was just more interesting. Just to take take the elements of the genre, like use the, use the genre as a foundation, and it, and um, and uh, instead of the the cliches being a handicap um, to what we we're doing, um, use them to our advantage uh, in terms of their their shorthand that you have going into it. Where everyone, even if you have not seen many westerns, or you're, you're familiar with with sort of the the, the tropes of uh, of the genre and so we can you know from the very beginning of the movie kind of set up certain expectations uh for where the story is supposed to go and then it gives us a platform to then you know deviate from that and go in different directions would you go so far to say that uh you even want to your audience afterwards to have a different look on the canon because that's what i had you know i felt about you know, like, can I take John Wayne walking in as seriously anymore <laughs> as before, you know? So. Yeah, I, I mean, well, especially like the John Wayne stuff and what Dave was saying with, with it being a product of the time and th those were, you know, the, uh, the romantic idea of the West and, and for, for this being such an American genre, you know, the idea of um, if you go West, everything is going to be better and, you know, manifest destiny and, and, and all this sort of, you know, um, jingoism from the, that's part of the American past. Uh, that's what the John Wayne westerns were a lot about. And so, you know, when we when we were looking at this particular story, it just it it, it for us it was more uh, interesting to kind of take the what is normally a very macho um, you know type of type of film and just kind of make the male characters you know. Just cut them down a little bit because Ma emasculate a very macho genre. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, and uh, you you have seen it in the very first scene. There's you playing uh, the uh, the guy sitting there while uh, Robert Foster is uh, standing up and going away. So the manifest destiny is crushed in the very first scene, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you uh, go on. I think we can say that in a bit later scenes to to. To be a preacher, or in the uniform, is in his uniform and in in his, in his steps. So we we see you uh, um, on the screen. That's that's a regular thing for you both to act in your films. Um, how was that probably different this time with Damsel, as you had, I would say, much more well-known actors in many roles, starting from Robert Forster. We have seen Mia Wiesikowska, we have seen Robert Pattinson. How did that maybe, maybe change the way of working, or was it just exactly the same for you being in front of the camera with them? Well, I, th I think if it was the first time we were putting ourselves in front of the camera, we'd be terrified. But we've, I mean, it's just, we've, everything we've done has just been an extension of what we've done previously, and it, it traces all the way back to when we were 
making home movies on VHS, you know, cameras in our backyard when we were uh, children. So it's just, and, and that started from well, us, you know, we didn't know, the, the liberating thing when you're making things at that age is you don't know what a director, producer, writer, anything, you just know there's a person in front of the camera and a person behind the camera and um, to, to press the button so you then can perform in front of it. And, um, and, uh, and so just, just through, just that's kind of, since, since we've just always operated that way, when we don't act in everything we, we do, but when, when appropriate, we, we love to. And, um, and, and so it's, 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 it's kind of second nature for us to, to wear, um, wear several hats with that. And that said, we, because we were working, well, I mean, with any time we're acting with other people, um, uh, we, we, it's, it, it's, you know, it can, it's, you have to be, um, it can be obnoxious to put yourself in a movie, or, you know, you have to take some, take some guts to put yourself in a movie, good or bad. And, um, um, and so you're, you're, you're setting yourself up, you know, for a lot by, by doing that. And so we just make sure that um, if, 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 we're act, if we're acting in something, especially with, with, with stars like that, that we just have everything on our end as, as actors, like, worked out prior to, to making it so that when we're on set, we're, you know, working with them, there's not, we're not wasting time when we're figuring something out with our character. It's, like, all about, all about them. Yeah, D David and I have, you know, <clears throat> Prior to filming, we had been working on this film and all of our films and talking about them for much longer than we had with anyone else. And so we know that, you know, our time uh, is is a luxury. And when we're working with, um, you know, even the cinematographer or production designer, that's limited. And so we have to make sure that, you know, we're bringing as much to the table so that they can take it and go to another level with it. I think like with with Robert Forrester, we just had a day that he flew in the day before, and we shot with him in the desert, and he flew out that afternoon practically. <laughs> so, so you, you want to make sure that um, you know when, and these are smaller films that we're making, and all the money is going on on the screen, so that uh, as as long as we have you know um, the tone set and 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 an idea going in, that way we we're not wasting everybody's time, and we're able to to stretch the budget further and, and to, to kind of, you know, be able to go shoot out in the middle of nowhere and with a small crew and, and kind of manage it all. Um, yet I have this feeling from the very start at the, um, at, as the credits are rolling that, that you infuse also by being in front of the camera or having this fluid relationship of being in front or behind to, to, to infuse that playfulness also in these other actors. I mean, the way they smile and the, sm the smile is about to break there. This reminds us, of course, of portrait photography in the old days when people were standing there awkward and trying to give their best image. <laughs> but this is also, this is, I mean, this, this dance scene went on forever, actually, in the shooting. Tell us a bit about, about that. Well, yeah, we wanted, um, th there's, it, it's, there's, we wanted to have you know this kind of like manic kind of dreamy quality to, to the opening and that um, if it, that that title sequence sets up the relationship for the for the two stars that that goes in it in a, it, it sets things up for later in the film but we we wanted um, yeah just this this kind of a static manic quality and then where they're where they're they're looking in the camera you know in a you know kind of portrait style um, and then we we liked the idea of, of kind of like pushing them to the to the brink of <laughs> exhaustion or mania with it. like with when they when he's spinning around and holding when Robert Pattinson is holding Mia we just let the take go on forever and they're just standing there waiting for us to call cut and and that's when they're the, when the acting breaks down and it's just you know, it's very real and it's just them like no two humans straining trying to hold each other <laughs> up and, and that was such a pure moment I yeah. loved it so we just I, I, I would have kept going for hours rolling it you know until um, yeah, even the extras kept clapping so yeah, it was really yeah. surreal like yeah. no no one knew when to stop and we had the um, the band was there playing live so that we we, we would have the, the same title music that they were dancing to and uh, yeah like David said we just kind of watched it in the monitor and then all right I guess we should let them yeah, off yeah. the hook <laughs> Uh, but by the way, that gives me the opportunity. Josh and Yvonne are also here for, uh, with us from, from the Octopus Project. So if you have any questions regarding this intimate artistic relationship that you have been having for uh, more than a decade, uh, of course, you are also here to maybe comment. So great to have you also here. Um, <clears throat> um, so 
let's see another excerpt to uh, dive in a bit more into this deconstruction of classical male Western roles. We see practically we're just jumping in uh, directly after the scene we have uh, we have witnessed before. So I, I, we can very well understand the tone of the whole film and you put a lot of work, of course, into finding that balance between, uh, you know, a kind of realism that goes in, into the totally absurd and one quality of that or one um, important thing of, is, of course, the length of scenes of waiting. Um, um, maybe we should at this point talk about writing first. How do you write together? This is, I mean, I, I know that... Uh, most, uh, when it comes to credits, it's mostly you for the writing and produce, uh, for the writing and directing. Rather, when you look it up on certain uh, websites, and it's always producing sound design with you in, in in that sense more. But but you do everything together. So, how would you come up with a scene like the one we've just seen in the bar? Uh, I don't know. It's hard. It, it, we go. Th it's funny. You just go through. Uh, it, there's so many levels in making, you know, the, the steps you go through in making the film. Then when we're done, it's kind of all a blur. How it all, and then I feel like each time I start, we start over. It's like a new, it's a new, a new process. Um, we don't do the kind of thing where we like write a certain amount every day. It's kind of like we go a long time with just kind of gestating ideas, and um, uh, and and that you know, and and then 
and 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 then and then they just kind of all I don't know. Then we a lot of, a lot of time you know, just thinking about things, and then they kind of all come out once in writing. I mean, for a scene like this, it was uh, I don't know. This it felt like. Uh, we wanted to have a saloon scene since that's what you normally. You know, just it seemed like the appropriate what, when people first go into a western town, they, the first place they go is the, the saloon. But people, they're always drinking whiskey, and I think the thought process for that, I was thinking like, if I was in the Wild West and I was out in the desert, I'd be so dehydrated. I would want water. <laughs> that's like <laughs> such an uncool thing for a cowboy to have. But just think, like I just I would, I would I would always think about that when I watch a western, like how like in the middle of the day when the sun is blazing down in you like drinking whiskey just seems like the worst idea ever and and uh and and so then that then that i think that like for example that's kind of where that came from yeah i, I mean this yeah this scene is just in you, you know it's like david was saying it's a lot of western movies start off with the loner coming to town and going to the saloon and getting hassled by the locals there and it's always like these fringe locals or you know, picking on, on, on the outsider. And, and um, so it's, it's, you know, when we're, when we're looking at it, at it, it's like, how do we tweak it? You know, how do we make things a little bit different? And it uh, usually ends up in a bar yeah. fight or something. And, we and, 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 and this, this one though, like with the joke with, um, you know, that's part of the writing. And then as things kind of move on, like when we're, when we're filming it, things kind of present themselves and you run with it. So you kind of have this, this foundation again. And like, for example, we had this, this prop malfunction with the, the guitar strap uh, that he was supposed to wear. And so it worked really well when it was on him, but it was impossible to take off. And so Rob, you know, was supposed to go into the bar and, and take his stuff down and saunter in and put his things against and order a drink. And he's like, I, don't, I have no idea how I'm going to take this guitar off. And, and so he said, well, let's just make it as awkward as possible and just struggle with it. And it fit his character. And it fit his character, and it was really funny. So those happy accidents happen, and you just kind of embrace them. And I think that's part of, like, from the script level, as long as everything tonally is, is, is set, that, that you can notice those things happening and, 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 and take advantage of it. Just, just a little detail more. You even have him th singing later on a, a song called Honey Bun, <laughs> which is also very absurd. Uh, who did the writing of that song there? Is uh, it Robert? Or <laughs> it's I, I wrote the lyrics and the Octopus Project did the, the music. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, you, have, uh, you should absolutely see the film just for that scene. But we, yeah, we knew that he could, um, that, that Robert was, a, he, that he was he, he's a great musician and, and, and can sing, and so. That was an added bonus, and there's this, and we just—I don't know—I like the idea of like a cowboy ballad. In the movie. Again, this is this is a reference, of course, a totally twisted reference to classical uh, classical western that uh -huh. happened before. Yeah, um, uh, we could. Uh, I, I wanted to go back a bit to to your beginnings, as you said. VHS was the beginning. You studied film, actually. You, you come from from computer science, and there's. Um, you said in one interview, you said like, our first two features bombed. That was back in the 90s, end of the 90s, or beginning of the 2000s, and then you went back into short filmmaking, which is a very, very interesting uh, phase, of course, that opened up a lot of experimentation for you, having seen all your shorts, they are very different. So I would like to, uh, to talk a bit about the phase when you had to like reconfigure what you want to do together yeah, well, we I mean, we've been making we would just make. I think it's the same pattern that a lot of people make when you're uh, when we we're kids and you, the first thing you do you, when we get with a family like for Christmas got a VHS camera and and before you or at least for uh, before we came up with our own ideas it was you would just copy what you'd see you know so we'd see you know some like Rambo or some you know action movie and then you just and it's like little you know ten year old kids trying to mimic that and. Um, and uh, and then thinking it's the greatest thing ever, and then watching it and just being sad. <laughs> but um, and uh, and then we just do that, and then and then I think then after after college, we we it's it was just a funny mindset um, that we had. When I was 22 and Nathan was 20, and we just think, okay, well now we're adults. We we don't do shorts anymore. We just do features because that's what you're supposed to do. And so and we made um, right after the university, we we, um, uh, we we made our first feature that we'd saved up for forever and we shot it on 16 millimeter in the late 90s and it and we just thought we thought um 
you know, like the, the, the model of like the Kevin Smith and Robert Rodriguez sort of thing, well, you make your first film and you're 22 and then you're a success or whatever, we made it and then like no one cared and it didn't go anywhere and we lost a lot of money on it or all our savings. And so, um, uh, and, and it just, so then we had to kind of like reset our expectations for what we were doing. Um, and then we went and made, then once DV um, became a, a viable option for, for shooting, we, we made another feature that was very personal and, and I'm still happy with it, but it's completely inaccessible because it's, uh, it, it's, it's called Frontier and it was in a completely made up language. We had just been watching a lot of Eastern European war films and wanted to make one in Texas and, and we don't speak anything other than English, so we just made up a language and, and did this film that is not accessible at all, but it was very, it was very fun to do. And then after that we went back to making we, we went to shorts and that's where it was so liberating because these features you spend like two years of your life making something and then and then you throw it out into the void and you know then in those cases they don't go anywhere and so the nice thing with the shorts is we could they didn't cost much money didn't take up much time and we could we could go in all kinds of different directions and it wasn't a big setback uh, if 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 it, something failed it was it was um, just part of the process yeah, it, was, it was changing the mindset of like oh I have this idea but it's not really fleshed out and it seems like a neat scene or an experiment to do, or it would be cool to try this. And then, you know, if, if, if instead of like waiting for like this grander feature form of that idea to emerge, it was like, well, let's just go out and shoot it and, and turn it into a short. And if it, if it's, and, and, and just keep making things and just kind of, you know, um, uh, yeah, the, the idea of just, just constantly shooting something and, and editing and, and doing sound mix and stuff like that and kind of learning all the different parts of filmmaking. You know, I think that was that was pretty important. And it really fed the creativity too because we would, like with the, those two features we did, each of those, it would, it would, that would ate up several years where everything, everything hinged on that, the success or failure of, of what, of everything we were trying to do was on those. And, um, and then also when you're in your early 20s, everything is heightened and more dramatic. <laughs> so if, if this doesn't you know, succeed, then everything is doomed kind of thing, mentality. And so there was a really liberating thing of, about, about the shorts, and we love shorts. And we still, you know, and, we've, and then as we've gone um, back into making features, we've occasionally done short films and would, would like to do that again, you know, um, uh, in, in between features. It, it's a, I think it's a fun way to change things up. Uh, and the shorts helped you a lot uh, in, in getting things back on track in the sense that they were, they were successful, they were invited to many festivals. Could you comment uh, a bit more about that phase? How, what was important or is there a certain moment that you very uh, fondly remember that changed things for you in a way? Yeah, there was, there was one year um, in particular where we made like three or four shorts and we were cheap so we would just put them all on one DVD and then we would send them into a festival. And pay one submission and pay fee. One submission fee, <laughs> knowing that they're going to put the the disc in and see. Oh, there's three shorts here to watch, and they're all like five minutes long. So, we had a couple places that programmed two of them or whatever. Or, you know, you <clears throat> you play the percentages. Maybe the one that you submitted they don't like, but they'll like the other one down the line or something. And that uh, that that's just kind of a funny aside. But the the shorts did kind of open the door for us and um, through Sunday through Sunday in particular started, um, seeing them and program them and so we we started getting involved with that family and and uh, you know just just kind of getting exposure and support outside of our little bubble in, in Texas well, I guess we should have a look at one of these shorts would you like to say something before we see Jetsam Flotsam um, well this we made this uh, this is in 2005 and um, it was like the, the shorts we would do, some of them were, it, it, we just, it was, it was fun just trying all kinds of ideas where some would, what, some would be very narrative and it would just be a dialogue driven scenario and then others were uh, more, more uh, abstract or just, or, or just playing with form. And, um, uh, and, and one, I guess, well like something with, uh, in a way that's similar with Damsel and Kamiko with this short is we kind of like the idea of some, uh, sometimes of playing with like two ha a film that's kind of in two halves, and so this was the first, this short because um, both of those those features I mentioned are there's there's kind of a there's a there's a, a quality of them that are divided in in halves, and this has a similar thing with the short. So please let's see the film.
Um, this is this is so interesting because basically when it comes to collaboration and working as <laughs> as uh, with with the people around you working together, it's all in place back then. The Octopus Project. This was the first film that you did together, 2005. So. Um, we just heard you've come a long way. It's different. It was very <laughs> playful, you know. This was a time when you, you have the feeling with all the short films, this was about creative outbursts and being very different because what you combine here is basically the aesthetics of experimental and found footage. And, and all, I mean, all these different shorts are extremely different than what they are. Um, but, but please tell us a bit about how you found your kind of creative family back then, probably. Well, it's so you know, it's so hard to make a film, even a short film. You know, there's a lot of lot of work involved, um, and and you and and um, and so I don't know. We we want to in, enjoy the process as as we're as we're doing it and work with people. So it's it's so it's fun working with friends and it's fun working with and and then and it's easier working with friends and easier working with with people that you uh, have have a history with have, have a shorthand. Um, it's it's so hard when you if you're having to start over every time with a new group of of, of people and and have that familiarity. So it, it's it's definitely like uh, so, it's because we've you know like with with the, the composers um, we, you know because we've worked together so long. We are, it makes you know everything we're doing now. They just have a shorthand out out of the gate for for where we're going and um, and, uh, and 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 so yeah and and you want to like. You know, you part like, with everything we make. We want to, in, it's not so much an ends justify the means kind of thing. It's, we like to be able to enjoy it while we're doing it. And so it's you know, if you're on a boat with people that you know that you don't like it or can't trust or whatever, it's that's 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 a pain. And, and then and then along those lines with um, sorry, along those lines with uh, with 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 some of the ideas we'd come up with, they were based on. On what would be what would just be fun to do, and it was like it would be fun if like I don't, this is one of the most fun shorts we ever did, just because it was like well, oh, there's no other situation where we were going to end up on a boat dealing with sharks and and all kinds of craziness, and um, and and that was that was part of the allure of doing it was the the adventure in, in making it because um, we didn't tell the well we would do it differently now, but we did, we we were too shy to tell the the. The, the guy that drove the boat that we were making a movie, so he just thought we were going on a fishing trip, and then we, or, or that we were making a documentary about, or you know, he showed up, and then we, we, we were loading in a chicken and all this luggage, and he was real confused at first, but then he got into it, and, and it was, yeah, it was so just. He was informed previously that you had this. Uh, yeah, we, we, he knew we were gonna make something, but he, did, he wasn't quite sure. And yeah. It was in the Gulf of Mexico, and then he got really into it and uh, kept turning the boat around with suggestions on where better lighting was. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, and that's the kind of, um, you know, it's, it was collaboration. But it was and where cool. to find the sharks instantly, yeah. like, yeah, which is. It was, so that, those things are fun because we just that's that's part of the what the joy of filmmaking is where you can go into these environments that you would never be priv privy to and and so that's part of the design of it and finding a creative you know way to um, to to make that that uh, a part of what you're doing. Now of course these are totally different projects, but maybe there were learnings from back then when it comes to uh, not only immediacy or using the, the the moment, but also how to juggle a budget because what you said before when we were talking was that this damsel is not necessarily like a high budgeted uh, practically hollywood project it's not it, it is uh, it it has the same dna that you worked with before maybe you could comment on how um you work with budget this is to nathan as being um, the credited producer i mean one. way back when when we were doing shorts it was it was sort of like uh, it was a weird idea where every short we would save enough money to buy another piece of equipment and then that equipment would go towards the short and then the next short we wouldn't have to rent that equipment. We could just save up money and buy the next piece and the next piece. And so we kind of had this very, you know, scaled, uh, you know, camera package and microphone and and so that helped us like when we eventually went and did um, like Goliath and stuff like that. So. Um, but it's it's all about you know for for us it's <clears throat> how much of the money that we can put on the screen and 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 we like the idea of going.
to, to places and shooting locations and having that be part of the film. Like we like the idea of going down to the to the coast of Texas and, and, and getting out on the water and, and finding a cheap way to do that. Or with Damsel, we wanted to go shoot in the mountains and, and you know, there's there's obviously versions of, of of these films that would be much smaller if our our, our budget was out of hand and, and we were spending too much on you know things that we didn't need and 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 also when when we're when we're when what we usually try to budget for especially on the features is let's get as many days possible so that we're not um, you know undershooting the film and that we, we 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 make sure that we have the time to do things right or to um, you know uh, to, to accommodate changes in weather or you know whatever you know a locate like on damsel we had a location that we wanted to film at in utah and uh the week before we were going to film there it got struck by lightning and there was a there was a, a huge fire and the whole mountain burned down and, and and so we were like kind of scrambling to find something else some other place to shoot and and the because we had some flex days kind of stored at the end of the schedule that we had you know, budgeted for, we were able to do that. And because our crew was small, we didn't have to have this huge footprint to move from one place to, to the next. We were able to like be scalable and, and go someplace. Like the, the opening scene with, with Robert Forrester was just like this skeleton crew and we purposefully put that near the end of the shooting schedule so that as the, our bigger stuff was at the beginning and we kind of tapered down and then at the end of the shoot, it was just a few of us that went down with, with David and, and Robert and, and, and sound and camera and, and, and shot in this kind of like remote location. We didn't have to bring a whole bunch of people there and make a bigger production that it, than, than it needed. Could you be a bit more specific about the days as well as the budget? Uh, would, you, would you like to comment or rather? Uh, I won't comment on the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it, 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 was, it was very modest. Um, but days, we, you know, that one was 30, 33 days. And, 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 and in that, we were, I would say that it was a 30, 33 day shoot on, on, and we've had, we've known people With a that, few travel within it. With a few travel days. And, and, and we actually had a, a couple days on the Oregon coast. So we were able to take another skeleton unit um, from Utah to Oregon, which was a you know a, a plane ride, um, and and knowing similar ranges of budgets of other people's films, that's it's usually you get like 23 to 25 days out of that. So we made sure that we were able to stretch it enough that we had the time to, uh, you know, I, I think a 33 day shoot is a, is a luxury. I think. Now, uh, Kumiko or Kid thing were uh, really intense. Uh, films, but they didn't, they weren't, still Damsel is not star driven, but it has stars in it. So there's a different approach, uh, in, and that's very interesting, of course, to young talents. How do you approach stars? I mean, was that direct private connections? Was it a classical way you go through agencies? I think it's very important this point, how oh, to yeah. structure it differently. Well, there's no one way to do it, you know. Um, <laughs> and so, but for us, uh, well, with let's see, for for um, it was the first person on board was um, was Robert Pattinson, and um, and that was just through our agents contacting his agent. Um, we'd gotten a, a decent amount of attention for our previous uh, film, Kamiko, and um, he he he'd seen that, and then and then and and uh, and, and liked uh, the script for Damsel, and so that 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 got a meeting, and. Um, uh, I don't know, and then we just he he uh, you know like like his I really you know appreciate his his the, the choices he's made been making in these in these films, um, particularly as of late have been really I interesting, and we're just looking at every, you know the, the past several films he's made, and then the the films he has coming up, and it's like it was like oh that's all directors that we really admire, you know, so he has like really good we felt oh he has really good taste and it's very curated. And um, and and he's very film savvy, and it was just like he very quickly dialed into the the there was already a shorthand after reading the script and talking with him where he he, he got the vibe we were going for, and it was just it made it very very easy and effortless, and that's where you know if you get that out of the way, then most of your work as a direct in terms of directing actors is done, you know, just once you are in sync in that way, um, and so we felt good with that, and then Mia um, came in later. And um, that was in part he, he, she, and, and Rob were friends, 
Uh, they, they'd known each other a long time, and they'd worked together on uh, that Cronenberg film, uh, Map, Map, to, Map, Map to Stars. Map to Stars. Map to Stars. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and so, and so that, that helped facilitate you know, that, that introduction. And, um, and then she liked, her, liked Kimiko and liked the script. And, and, and um, in, in circumstances where other people that had seen it were, would, other actors would be like, afraid of the, the material, the, the, the unconventional, as, a, as an unconventional structure. And then, and, um, and, and the, the, you know, the characters become different things throughout the, the film in, in terms of what your expectations are. And I think some people would shy away from that. And instead, to their credit, they both, that was what made them excited about it. And those are specifically what wanted to make them do it. So it was, they were, that, that, they were, they were very, you know, hungry and excited uh, to, to be on board with that. Um, and then, the other, then like Robert Forrester, um, we that was that was a totally that was he was um, uh, a friend of ours had had met him before, and so that was that was just through a friend connection. Yeah. And and the nice thing, I mean, you know, I guess looking back at it now, like everything, all the shorts helped do the features, and 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 so the nice thing when when we're when we're doing a movie that's um, you know, structurally or tonally different, with, I would say like Kamika or, or, or Damsel, you know, they would read the script and then they would have a, a visual sort of representation of what we were going for. So like, it, it, was, it was a nice package to put together of like, here's our previous work and this is kind of the humor that we like and this is what we're doing and then here's the script that we want you to, 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 to work with us on. And I think that was, um, you know, a huge benefit. I think it's 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 a little bit harder if you're just going with the script stage, and 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 so so for us, like keeping active and keeping making things, even like Kid Thing was such a, a small small movie, um, that helped us when we were trying to make Kamiko, and and so it just kind of even this even the small stuff has 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 a, a cumulative effect of 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 kind of educating people as to what what they're in for. We're having them trust that we'll follow through with what we're saying. The interesting thing is there's Goliath in 2008, then there's uh, Kid Thing 2012, if I recall right, then Kumiko 2014, now Damsel. But uh, the, the, the flow of the films could have been otherwise because you're developing simultaneously for such a long time. So how, for how, uh, how long did you have Damsel in mind? Or working. Yeah, we've working? never. Yeah, hopefully it'll go quicker with other stuff. We've never had the luxury of like writing something and then making it right away. I mean, the advantage to that is is the scripts got better over time, and we we're able to get distance from it. And if we'd made Damsel five years ago, it'd be very different from what it is now. And and same with Kamiko. But um, I think it was just. I think you know when we were younger, like in our head, we just operated very linearly. Like, well, you, this is the way, the order we're going to do things in, and this, and then you wait until you can do it in that exact way. And for I think for very few filmmakers that you have that luxury, you know, you it's you you um, you, you kind of so it's it's unless you just want to wait forever, you know. But we um, uh, both for creative and financial reasons, we won't want like like to, to to work more often than that. And so I think we with with Kamiko. I mean that that I that idea we wrote in uh, is is based on a is based on this this story this urban legend that circulated in the early 2000s and so we were working on that script uh, you know 15 years ago and um, and uh, and it, because half of the film is in Japanese and half is in English it was very difficult to get financing for understandably um, and and there was versions of it that people were willing to do. You know, much earlier, if if we were willing to compromise, what they wanted to, you know, because we, we, we shot half the film in Japan and half in America, and they're like, well, can when they're in Japan, can the everyone, every Japanese person in the movie speak English, and that just was infuriating and would be terrible. So, we we um, we weren't we wouldn't compromise on that front, but then we would compromise in terms of the order we were doing things. So, uh, while we you know waited for Kamiko, then we went and made both. Um, uh, this film called Goliath and another one called Kid Thing because those were those were made with, with um, just w with some grants and um, a lot of favors and, and then our own money and we those were things that we could do on a very small scale with 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 you know at a lot of without much risk and um, and and we know that we could get them done on like we were the only ones that were holding back getting them done um, and the nice thing about it is both of those films then you know helped instill confidence in people 
for when we did, you know, make make Kamiko. Um. Now, Goliath has has you as the lead again, as a man whose uh, relationship has broken down, and he's still longing for the cat as a symbol of a former times of a kind of healthier psyche and a healthier love life. Um, and then came the transition with Kid Thing. You have for the first time you have uh, a girl as the lead, so you you kind of changed to female heroes and um, uh, what what how come did this change come about because this is something that even if we haven't seen it in damsel in the beginning still interests you because at the, at the core this is a film this is Mia's film but we <laughs> find out later on you mm. were talking about two halves so um, when did this transition came in come in well there's I, I just you know in general there's not enough films with with interesting female lead characters, and so often they're there to serve the you know the the male the male character. Uh, whether they're yeah, and and with 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 kid thing, we wanted to do a it's it's kind of a it's kind of a coming of age story with, with about this this, uh, this little girl that's a, kind of a juvenile delinquent, and it doesn't really have any kind of parental guidance, and so she's almost kind of feral. She just kind of goes off and. And she has no moral compass because there's no one to really guide her. And I've seen films like that with, with, with little boys. There's lots of little boy, you know, angry, angry little boy movies. But we hadn't seen one with, with, with a girl from that, that point of view. And, um, and so that seemed, that seemed something interesting to us uh, to, to explore. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, with Kamiko, that was another, that, 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 it was, that was a character that we'd never seen a whole movie Built, you know, built. A, it would be someone, some, some interesting person on the side, normally, um, uh, uh, some, you know, so some strange character on the periphery, and we really liked with, with, with uh, making um, her, you know, everything centered around her. So it's just, I don't know, just um, some. It's partly based on things we want to see personally, and things that we don't feel are that we haven't seen enough of out there. That that kind of draws us uh, to, you know, to having these these female driven uh, stories um, and uh, and, it's, and also it's just boring to do the same stuff everyone else has done I think so we want to just at least at least attempt to try something different now let's get to know this character of Annie in kid thing a bit we have an excerpt here please roll it
I guess I could have set that up a little more. <laughs> there's a so it's a, it's there's this little the little girl you know just that's kind of left to her own devices to kind of roam the countryside. But then there's a a sort of fable element to it where she uh, or fairy tale element where she discovers the, uh, this 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 hole in the ground in the wood this old abandoned well and there's a there's a, a mysterious voice coming from it. There's this woman asking for her help, and, and she develops a relationship with this, this um, disembodied voice over the course of the film. And you don't know how much of it is, is real or, or not. And only by standing there at the well, we as, uh, as the audience uh, get this ever heightened sense of suspense because this is potentially a human being that's about to die. And it, the situation simply doesn't change because there's no moral compass in any. So this is um, uh, in, in the sense of really wanting to save her immediately. Mm -hmm. That's what you would have there. So uh, it is played by Sydney Aguil, or Aguirre, the, the girl. Oh, yes. yeah? yeah. And how did you find her? Because this is, this is really, I mean, amazing. You, you are playing her, the responsible person for her within, <laughs> or, or, yeah, or rather not. But yeah. <laughs> how did you find, uh, find the girl? Too. Um, she's, uh, well, it, we, we didn't want, and this was done on a very, a very low budget, so it was also, like, we, we, I don't know, we, we kind of built it around, when, when we really decided that we wanted a, a, a because when we first started coming up with a story, it just, it just, because it's, it's what we've seen, we just, we're, it was going to, we're thinking like a, a male, you know, a, a child, a, a boy, as, as a main character, and then that seemed like we've seen that sort of thing before, and then, and then um, the, she's actually a daughter of a friend of ours who um, she she is she's the, uh, a much much happier person than the character in the film. But she was very much a tomboy, and she she was like the age right before she the um, is it the interesting age. She was she was 11, and is right before like feeling you know having to um, she wasn't uh, so confined to to um, uh, uh, what what boys or girls were supposed to do? She wasn't she wasn't wearing makeup or wearing dresses or anything. She was very much a tomboy, but she didn't think of herself as a tomboy. She just thought of herself as a, a kid that liked to go out and play and was athletic. And there was no boundaries of what she could or couldn't do that some boy couldn't do. And it just it wasn't like it was it was radical. It was just like it was just like that wasn't a factor, you know. And so we really that was something that was just in in this in in this this part of this girl to begin with. And, and there was this, just this, and she did a naturalism to her. We didn't want like a, a, a very performative, you know, child actor. And so um, that, so, so that we just knew that she would be perfect for the, for the role with, with that. Um, it, this gives us also, this excerpt gives us, gives us also the opportunity to talk about sound design and actually working together artistically with your composers. Um, you, as the sound designer, as, uh, so often in, in different projects, how uh, how would you say? I mean, this is extremely important for the tension, how it mounts up, even in, in this little part that we have seen. So tell us a bit more about working on Kid Thing, um, on the soundscapes. Yeah, with, with 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 that particular part, I mean, that a lot of that was we just we would, you know, edit a scene and then uh, you know talk about musical influences that would fit the the tone and and hand it off to the Octopus Project, and then they would come up with something, and you know, often we would uh, start changing our edit to fit the music and vice versa, so it was really collaborative. I know some projects get all the way done, and then they hand it off to the composer to just score across, and, and uh, that's, that's definitely one way to do it. Um, for us, it was, it was much more back and forth, so we'd be sending files back and forth, and on the sound design, um, part of it, uh, so outside of the score, where sometimes, especially in Kamiko, uh, the, the movie after this, where they kind of blend together, um, they would send us specific music cues, and then sometimes we would just ask for particular elements of a song uh, so that we could carry it into the next scene or start mixing it with, um, you know, background elements and, and birds and, and, and wind and kind of uh, create like a soundscape so, you know, Ideally, there would, there would be times when you couldn't tell where the score ended and the sound design kind of took over. They were kind of a, a nice, you know, marriage between the two. And, and that was, um, you know, kind of the goal when we set out on those, on those two movies for sure. Oh, and that's something that's so, like, like, I feel like sound design is such an underutilized part of filmmaking a lot of the times because um, it just, just by nature of the, 
the, the process of making a film, usually that ends up being like one of the very last steps. And, and sometimes, I don't know, people either run out of money or run out of time or you're, just, or you're just exhausted by that point. And so there's not as much thought put into the sound design process, but it's so, it's, it, like in the big picture, it's relatively cheap and there's so much you can accomplish. And there, I don't know, it's just, it's, when you, uh, I, I just feel it can be so, so effective when, when you take advantage of it and, and, and uh, there's so much potential with it. And so that was, that's always a really fun, and, and so many filmmakers we admire that, that really in, in, embrace that and, and take it you know, to its fullest extent. And, and, and I just remembered that with, um, with Kid Thing, the, the voice of Esther in The Well is played by the late actress Susan Terrell, who um, in the later part of her life lived in Austin and was actually friends of the Octopus Project initially, and, but we all became uh, familiar and um, we brought her into the studio and she, she did the lines uh, in, in their studio while we were doing um, music and scoring and stuff like that. But it was fun because I, I remember we placed different microphones around the room to f see how kind of uh, how we could record her voice as kind of distant as possible. And she has like this crazy, unique, uh, you know, powerful voice. But it was starting to mix different different mics to kind of like bring it together. And that was something that we did uh, in in partnership with 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 the band. So I, I don't know how many you know, composers actually <laughs> lend lend equipment to help that much detail in the sound design, but it was fun. I was also thinking when seeing this little part uh, about the cows and that in every film you have a very specific way of filming animals. <laughs> we have seen Butterscotch, the pony uh, in, in this excerpt from Damsel. Uh, now we have seen the cows, but uh, th there's also, I was referring to Goliath and the cat and the way he finds the cat is also a very specific way. And then we have Kumiko. We won't. We will see a short part of Kumiko, but there won't be Bonzo, the rabbit, <laughs> which is also very important. In contrast to other filmmakers, I would say um, that the way you film animals, it's like nature doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. We, I mean, what we we love an, we, I just love animals, and then um, and so it's fun being around being around them and then but then also the way that they are incorporated in, in into nature or 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 the opposite the way they've been domesticated you know the, the, it's i think um I, so i guess what i'm saying is like uh the the relationship that that humans have with animals is interesting uh in all dynamics whether it's they're just simply food or 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 whether they're they're anthropomorphized in, into meaning something more than they 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 actually are that just all those different dynamics are kind of fascinating in, in terms of the, the human real, you know, relationship with, with animals. And, um, and, and so, I mean, so that, that you know, that, that, definitely, um, that definitely plays in, into this. And then we, we typically, we, I don't know, it's in terms of, like, like, a lot of times if you have a film and you have like a trained animal, that, especially like a dog or something, a trained, it's, that's, you know, hit marks, they feel very robotic, it doesn't feel, you know, they're looking at their master off camera and it feels really forced. And sometimes for certain things you need that, but there's something really beautiful and pure about an animal that you, you've not manipulated at all and you just kind of put it out there and, and, and you adapt to the animal instead of making the animal adapt to you. And um, you know, if you can do that, you get like the the most the purest performance of any living creature because <laughs> they they don't know what a camera is and there's no expectations and you're just going to get something very real and then there's something I mean it can be scary because it cannot go well sometimes but uh, but you know just but but you know the actor working off the animal instead of trying to make the animal work off the the actor. But the Scotch is the most relaxed pony ever. Yeah. Uh, the film. <laughs> well, that horde, that was a very, I mean, in terms, we we're talking about casting for Damsel, and that was, that was, a, that was just as important a part of the process in that, um, that this miniature horse is in uh, almost every scene of the movie, and it would be very easy for the animal to derail the scene. You're having dialogue in the horse's air, or it's distracting, you know, and so that would, it would, it's, it really, it, we're really setting ourselves up for, for potential failure with that, and so, we, we needed a horse that had, uh, I mean, and it was, thankfully it all worked, it, we got very lucky because from the script, it, we, it, we wanted the, to have the blonde Farrah Fawcett hair, you know, we wanted to have this very particular kind of like little, you know, blonde pony look. Um, but at the same time, we needed a, dis, a mellow disposition. 
and um, and and so we we had a pretty extensive like casting search for for the horse uh, not just for the look but just for the temperament because we rather than a horse that's been in a bunch of movies it was a horse that um, that is actually a service animal and it spends this is the only movie it's ever been in and we it's normally um, its day job is is going to uh, like being a service animal in, in hospitals and nursing homes and, and being in, in environments where she's been trained to be very calm and so it made it so easy to work with as long as we gave her graham crackers occasionally she would do <laughs> she was just happy hanging out so um, maybe we should see the little part because this is also up to you maybe you have questions uh, so we should see uh, the the final film or part of the film that we have here with us it's kumiko but i would like to um, this is from the second part when we're already in the u.s and kumiko then by then is with you in the police car okay. so maybe just some introducing comments because okay. we were talking about this urban myth that uh, that um, interested you in the first place in the beginning of the 2000s yeah it was so in, in the early 2000s there was uh, it, it started off on like message boards and it was basically um, that we just saw it online there was a story about this uh, that, that this Japanese woman um, left um, She, she she left her home in Tokyo and went to um, Minnesota because she was obsessed with the the Coen Brothers movie Fargo, and she convinced herself that the movie was was real life and that the money that Steve Buscemi's character buries in the snow was was actually out there in the snow waiting for her. And so she goes on this like modern day quest to to find the buried treasure, and um, and that just that was so that just and it was a That was such so, so fascinating. I just couldn't believe it when we read that that this was something real, um, and uh, and that the, the idea of someone going on a treasure hunt in you know, in, in the modern world, and, and that someone that would you know believe this, and I just wanted to know the psychology, you know, behind these choices, and um, and and um, and so there weren't there wasn't any information about it initially, and so just I think partly to satiate our curiosity, we started writing, like just just. Uh, why would how would this happen and started writing the, the script kind of based on that and then as time went by we learned that it wasn't the truth it was actually an urban it was actually uh, a urban legend that a woman did a Japanese woman did get lost in the wilderness in in Minnesota but it was it was not related to the treasure but it just the the kind of telephone game or saying I guess like the way that a story can change as one person tells another and then suddenly it becomes the truth and then also when something's on when you see the way you see something on the internet and it's presented as fact you know just anything on there someone puts it on then suddenly it's like it's it's it, then it's suddenly real that was the the way the stories develop in that way especially with such expediency whereas like folk tales would take generations to you know to kind of take shape this was This just had a domino effect, and that was also fascinating to us. So we, um, we, we then, you know, did the film. Uh, you know, we, we when we made the film, we stuck to the legend as the, uh, and didn't we didn't have any regard for the the truth of the story because it was the legend that was what drew us to it, and we so and and that that uh, and that was what we were faithful to. And so the film is structured in two parts, where the first half she's in uh, Japan and the second half she's in America. And what, where this scene takes place is um, she is, uh, she's, she's just been found wandering you know, around in the wilderness, kind of aimless with a, with a homemade treasure map. Um, and uh, a, a policeman um, finds her and is, is trying to help her, but there's a, there's a language barrier and, and, and confusion.
Now, now this character is genuinely hunting for a treasure out of uh, of a film, and the the interesting and, and outstanding thing is you respect her mission <laughs> from the very beginning to the very end. And uh, as we uh, have seen with your character, you genuinely want to help her from beginning to end. So um, there's no higher stakes, no classical development in the say, uh, like in a treasure hunt. Um, uh, and this gives us the opportunity to talk about uh, the development of, of character and also of plot in this specific case, and also maybe in Kid Think, how, however you want to comment, like the traps you want to avoid, or how you know, oh, this is not the way we want to go. This is, this is just getting overboard in this very specific moment. Let's go somewhere else with the script, with the story. Yeah, well, with the characters, like for, for you know, it'd be very easy, I, mean, I think, it, especially with, with Kamiko, but in general, it, it'd be very easy to make fun of the characters or, or just um, make, just make them a spectacle just for sake of, of, of doing so. And, and we, it was, uh, but it was important for us to have uh, uh, empathy for her and not like, we never say that she's crazy. We don't, we don't, um, we don't diagnose her. It was important for us to not do that. She, um, I, I think, um, is obvious there's some sort of, you know, you, presumably some kind of mental illness going on, but we don't want to diagnose it and get moralistic with it or, or put a label on her where then you can, you can kind of separate her from yourself and, and kind of put her in a box and then therefore, thereby kind of, I don't know, not have to relate to what she's going through. And so we wanted just to be able, and, and same with the, the little girl in, in Kid Thing who is, is a delinquent and makes a lot of, 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 of bad choices, but we, it's just important to, uh, again, we, don't, we didn't want to moralize um, with that and, and just kind of leave, like, um, just relate to them on a basic human level, and, um, and, and then if you can connect with them in that sense, then you're willing to go with them and have, hopefully have empathy you know, for them as just a, a complicated, me messy you know, human. Um, one, one more thing, the, um, when it comes to the costume, I think this is also a very important part, especially on Kumiko. Uh, would it go too far to say like the, the naivety and the determ determination of Red Riding Hood is somewhere in, <laughs> in her? Um, yeah, that's definitely subconscious. I, I, some, some of that is subconscious and some of it is very particular in, in the script. I mean, we, I don't know, we, just get, we get very detail-oriented with, with the color palette and, and the costume design in the scripts and, and then, in, and then in, in, the, in making it, we're very, just very hands-on with, with, with every, every bit of wardrobe with that. That's just, some, that's just fun to us and it's just, and it's in the same way with the sound designer, I think that is just another, or the, or, um, the, the score, it's just another, it's, a, it's another character in the film, you know, build, building on that. And uh, they just give you so much more room to do stuff. And like with, with Kamiko, um, in the scene, she's, she's wearing this like blanket and, um, that she got from a hotel that she cuts a hole in and makes it into a poncho. And part of that is just thinking what would be visually interesting. And, and, then, um, and then part of it, just thinking practically. It's, I think both the producer and the director, when we're concocting these stories, so I was thinking like, oh my God, we're making this movie out in freezing cold, our actress is gonna just, she is going to, she's gonna die out there. What can we, what, and we can't like, is she, we, we, you know, we can't hide things under her clothes to keep her warmer, so it's like, wait, she should, what if we have her in the hotel? Yeah, because, but the character would be dealing with the same issue as well, and so it's like, okay, what would she do? We just think, oh, she's in this room, she doesn't have any money, she doesn't have any other resources, okay, there's a comforter. Uh, she has a key that she cuts a hole in it with and then puts it on, and then the visual element of that is this big poncho, then that adds another level to it. And, and it just, just being kind of open to how those things come together. Um, and, and then like she wears a red hoodie prior to that, and I get, there is like, I guess, a, you know, a little red riding hood element to it. Um, uh, that was maybe a little more subconscious. It was, it was partly just seeing, knowing we were going to have a, just thinking about the color palette for the film. And, um, and that red, we needed something, she was gonna be in a lot of landscape shots off in the distance, and, and, we, and, um, and we needed her to stand out visually so you could just see her, and we knew red was a way to, to do that. And um, I really loved the way, like that movie Don't Look Now had a really neat use of the color red in terms of a really muted, you know, wintry kind of, uh, or just, uh, just kind of gray landscape, and how the red popped out, it was so, it was just very effective, and so um, that, yeah, so that's kind of how that came together. Now, please, your questions. 
I've seen, we've seen definitely very different films here in the selection. Uh, the guys who have seen Damsel. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. It's probably a little bit uh, sad to say, but I didn't like it so much. And I was wondering if uh, during the writing process you had any female input into that, because it seemed really odd. I was, I was uh, watching it yesterday with a friend of mine, and the both of us were sitting there and thinking, hmm, this looks like a movie that guys thought about how feminism might have worked. <laughs> Um, well, if, um, let's see. Well, it, that wasn't. We we weren't. We weren't. We're not trying to say how how uh, like. I mean that that way, that wasn't like a mandate we set out for in 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 make in, in making damsel. It was um, and and, in, and also in terms of like making some proclamation for for how we um, have you feminism or or, or 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 being the last word on anything like that. I think where we started from. And and like you know, no matter you know, at, uh, we at no matter how much we try, at the end of the day, we are white, straight, you know, male filmmakers, and and so we come, no matter what, we're coming to uh, our our filmmaking from that certain perspective. All we can try to do is relate to the characters on on a human level as much as possible, and 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 work from that. Um, with in the case of Damsel. Um, we, you know, what, what in in putting it together, we um, we we looked at like in, in terms of like the classic westerns and most of most of westerns, the the women in the film are mostly just a prop. They're there as an object of desire. There's something to be to be uh, obtained, and and then the men are are very macho and heroic and perfect at what they do, and um, and so for us it was it there was it was interesting to. Um, to, to, to kind of um, um, emasculate this kind of macho genre in, in that way and, um, and, 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 and instead of, and, 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 and make things more complex than, than simply the, this, the, the, um, this kind of object of desire that, that they're supposed to obtain and, that, and as if the, the female character in the movie is supposed to be, be great, grateful for that. And, um, and then also looking at the, the contemporary element of the way that the, uh, I don't know a lot of toxic relationships occur where where people um, kind of project um, their expectations of of what they want from the other person um, based um, based on what they need and um, and what they want and when they want it and who they want it from as opposed to um, having any consideration for what the what the other person might be interested or not. So that was kind of the approach we we took in constructing the film and and then did, just did the best we could from there. Yeah, and, and I would add that, that you know, when, you, when, you're, when we're working on a story and, and you're getting from point A to B, it's most of the characters, it's all about what's the choices that they make. And so for us, it was like, you know, was, it, the men are always making these horrible decisions and horrible choices with their lives, and you can see how that kind of has an effect on everyone around them. And so when we were looking at, at Penelope, the female character, you know, it was also, you know, and again, like David said, it's not a statement on feminism, but it's like for her to take in many of the, the situations that she's in, you know, it doesn't turn into, um, you, know, uh, you know, she she often takes the, the high road and she makes the choices that you wish the that everyone in the movie would be taking. And I think that's kind of the difference in, in where, you know, I guess her strength comes from and where all the male characters are, are essentially weak. And I think how that plays into the, what we were doing with the tropes of the Western genre, I think. Well, I think we didn't, I, I, and we didn't want, I think, I mean, everything in this is, you know, then you take it and you set it in the Wild West and then you add bigger stakes and put it, you know, up, uh, ratchet it up to absurd levels. But I think we, you know, we didn't want to put, uh, and the same with like, even like the, the, the part with like the Native American, character in the film it's like like I think typically in the films with 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 anything other than the white male it's like you're either you're either like you know crazy or savage or you're or you're put on a pedestal and so we tried to just just look at it just from a human standpoint of um, of of, of uh, these are all like you know, co complex humans that that are, are flawed in different ways um, but um, because we lead, we lead into it with with um, 
the, the, the male he hero character, which is not just like a trope of, of the Western, but a trope of like, I don't know, all, I feel like, I don't know, most Western storytelling, like all the way from like, you know, classical Greek mythology and that sort of thing. It's the man going to rescue the woman. We wanted to start off with that from the foundation, so it would inherently be focused on the point of view of the, the man. Um, and, and you're relying on his point of view as being like the truth and then, and then veering from it as you, as you learn that he's, he's, that it's, he's not the reliable narrator necessarily. Other questions or comments? Over there, please, yes, here. I really admire your work. It's, uh, it's really, it's re it was really great to see your short because I discovered Kumiko a few years ago and back home in Montreal, and I saw Damsel in Sundance two weeks ago, and I was, I just wanted to know how you, how you package movies that quirky and smart and creative like this, kind of, because you talk small budget, but it's they're, they're not cheap movies. They're not like like do-it-yourself movies. And also, second question is how you work on set as brothers. Yeah. Um, that's nice to hear because that most of them are do it yourself. <laughs> I mean, I mean, most of the films are do it yourself. We are kind of like wearing multiple hats, and and you know, it's like David said earlier, it's kind of an extension of home movies, just kind of getting bigger and and extending our family and working with different people who are who can do the job much better than we can. Um, I think yeah, like Kid Thing, for example, uh, I shot a lot of that and did the, did the camera work on it, and then of course with. Kamika, we met a great DP, and, and we got a chance to work with another uh, wonderful cinematographer on Damsel. But always, it's 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 it always feels much scrappier than 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 because we're 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 making these stories that are, I mean, set you know like it's it's hard to shoot in Japan, it's hard to shoot in the snow, and 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 so we're setting ourselves up for a challenge, and I think that's part of the excitement for us is to go someplace remote and exotic and, and, and capture film there. And, and so like the camera and, and, and uh, the look of it is, is, is very much in, in the forefront of our mind when we're, when we're doing that. And then as you know, uh, the way we work on set kind of depends project to project. Um, you know, David was doing a lot of the, the of heavy lifting on the acting side on Damsel. Um, so there was a lot of prep on our end to make sure that we knew uh, together, we can answer most questions, um, so that the the department heads or the actors could come to either one of us and ask uh, a, a question, and there wouldn't be sort of like a conflict of of, of ideas or anything like that. So, yes, please. There's another question. So you've obviously gone, uh, gone from strength to strength, and um, your next film, which I haven't seen yet, um, hopefully soon, has got a great cast, a top cast. So what's the next step now? Are you going to uh, look towards being represented by the likes of CAA to be able to speak to st studios, or um, what's the next move? Um, well, we, we, we have, uh, we have uh, representation in the industry, and that's, that's how we, it was, like you know, in terms of you're talking about uh, how we get things, these things together. Um, uh, this like damsel was much easier to put together than than Kamiko, and that we were doing that all ourselves. And then then because of that, we 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 got agents, and and they helped us get the money for damsel, and helped introduce us to the the agents. I mean, to the to the the other actors, you know, agents and stuff that that you know um, helped put it together in that way. So um, I think, in I mean, we're, we're, right now we're just, you know, finishing up, uh, we're gonna have distribution for, for this film and, um, and, uh, and then on to the, you know, ho hopefully everything we do helps, you know, get the next project going. So we have a, we have a, a few different projects we wanna do and it's just a matter of which one will, you know, take off sooner, but everything we're trying to, we're trying to, oh yes, yes. yeah, writing and, and um, yeah, we're writing and and uh, and want to adapt the book we want to adapt and um, and then but mostly our original material and uh, it's just yeah kind of whichever whatever whatever takes off first and like like David said earlier sometimes you have an idea in your head for years before you actually put it down on paper and so some of the like at one point we thought we were going to do Damsel before Kamiko so it kind of depends how the elements line themselves up because it's so difficult with actors' schedules and with financing and, 
and locations and everything to kind of come together at the right moment. It's, it's for us, we're trying to have some things stored away that maybe we've forgotten about or also our interests change, you know, in terms of like what we may or may want, not want to do. So it's good to be able to have something to pull out when, when the opportunity comes, but that's kind of where we are. A last question maybe from the audience? If not, I would like... There is? Go oh, ahead. is there one up there? Up there, okay, please. You have a microphone. There is a microphone. Oh, there's a microphone. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'd like to say that I really liked the movie. Uh, specifically, the cinematography was absolutely fantastic, the sound design, and I liked how the di dialogues were so unusual for this kind of movie. Like, the way they spoke, specifically Penelope, she was like out, out of that world. Uh, and I really li liked that. Uh, but the only thing that bothered me on the movie, per, 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 personally, was uh, the open ending that I didn't know where, Penelope, where Penel don't Penelope, give it away. Sorry. Don't give it away. No, I'm <laughs> saying was, I don't we know. Had, <laughs> we were working so meticulously on not giving away the film, and now like the open ending, I'm still like specifically. Sorry. So you didn't, but yeah, the ending okay. you didn't like. That, that right. I didn't know where she was heading in mm -hmm. the end. That's, that's okay. Fine. Well, so I, can can people who have no, haven't fine. seen it cover their ears and you can oh, tell no, no, me? Oh no, no, I can talk about where, it in general. Where, where no, she's no, no. heading? Well, I can talk about it in general terms. I mean, because Kimi Kimiko had a similar. Yeah, I, I think ending. with everything we do, I don't know. We I don't know. I I we I like films that don't give you answers to everything and give you some breathing room. I I, I hate it when people tell me what to think. Uh, and or, or try to button everything up like this is how you're supposed to feel, and um, and that and it's just a it's a, just a personal preference. But I, I like where it, 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 and with with it, what's been what's been nice when we've shared this film with dif different audiences. I mean, or our, our films in general is people take different things from it, and and sometimes you know it's nice. I mean, we like w when things are divisive. Sometimes when when, when Two people can take very different things away from the film, or if, or, or, or if they they like something that the other person dislikes, and vice versa. Because um, we're I, I don't have any interest in being didactic. Um, I mean, we definitely have a lot of thoughts that are put into it, but we're I don't want to you know we're not trying to button anything up. We're not trying to be the last word on anything, or or uh, or you know or, or, or summarize anything. Because we're figuring that all out for ourselves in the making of this. So it's just like we we and, and so much of it is subconscious anyway. So. We, you know, with everything we do, it's just, it's just more, it's just, it's very uh, gut driven and, 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 and there's just, and, and emotionally driven in terms of what, what feels right. And, um, and then, you know, and then, and then hopefully, you know, you put it out there and, you know, then you hope people can connect with it on a certain level. Yeah, I, I would, I would say like, um, not to spoil Damsel, but, or, or to spoil Kamiko, but Kamiko has an ending that, for example, uh, it was like David said when we looked at it, some audiences and some of the feedback was like, "Oh, it's a very sad ending," and some people would come up to us and go, "Oh, it's a very hopeful ending," and it's all kind of in the perspective of how you see the character or what moment you might you might be in or or, or how how it connected with you. And I think that's it's like David said, it's fun to get that sort of feedback and people having thoughts about the film and trying to figure things out and. Um, yeah. If everyone thought the same way about it, it would be boring. Yeah, it would be, it would, it would be like, you know, X-Men or Avengers or something. <laughs> so maybe the last question is, um, there's, there's this sense of campfire stories to all your films. I wanted to ask you specifically, because there's a campfire in Damsel, an actual campfire, but Kumiko, as we said, was an urban myth or an urban legend, and this is a story you could easily tell at a campfire. And that's the same thing for Kid Thing, actually. It's the, well, there was this girl going to this hole, and actually she didn't help that woman. So, so is that kind of, to, to bring something out of your subconscious, is that kind of the way uh, you think or get inspired first in something like um, that story structure or that arc? Um, I, think it's, I think it's like on a, probably on a subconscious level, just the way, you know, you're... Everything we're doing is, inf everyone, you know, all art's influenced by, or any, any story anyone makes is influenced by what, what they've, they've been exposed to, um, you know, previously. Like, no, we're, we're, no one is operating in a bubble with that. And, um, and so, I, I, you know, when we grew up, you know, you, with fairy tales, and, and I mean, like, like, kid thing is very much like a, 
there's, there's very much like a, a Grimm's fairy, fairy tale aspect to it, but then set in a, but then set in a, in a real world dynamic. Um, uh, but I mean, yeah, we grew up with fairy, uh, folklore and fairy tales and Greek mythology and all those sorts of things. And, and, and so we're definitely influenced by that. It just as the storytelling is in general, but we, um, we, it, I guess it is. And it, again, the, the most we ever really talk about it is in a setting like this that Nathan and I don't, don't, uh, we we don't intellectualize it um, with with, e with each we'd bore each other to death if we tried to do that I think but um, uh, but but um, I think it's 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 interesting I think it's so it's, it's mostly like subconscious and wired but it's interesting the way that um, we we do like the way that said we, uh, it is interesting the way that um, I don't know when you can juxtapose like the the folklore that's kind of wired into our upbringing or into society and and, and balancing that within elements of, of the real world. Thank you very much to both of you for being here tonight, or oh, this afternoon, <laughs> rather. Thank you. Thank cool. you very much. Thank you for coming. David Salna. Okay, thank, thank you. you.